Thanks for checking out One Church. If you're new to the church or want to learn more about us, you can always go to IamOneChurch.com. Now, here's this week's service.
waiting for you Dance like the weight has been lifted Grace is waiting for you Dance like the weight has been lifted Grace is waiting for you Dance like the weight has been lifted Grace is waiting
on, give Jesus another shout of praise in this place. Come on, it's going to be an awesome day at church this morning. Hey, if this is your first time here, we welcome you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, if this is your first time here, we just ask you, please take a moment to text the keyword, hey, the 33733. We just want to hear from you. On the way in, you should receive the worship guide, one that looks like this. This is going to let you know more about us. But as we continue our service, uh, can I pray? Father, we just thank you right now for every single person here. Father, we declare they're not here by accident, but Father, you got a word for them. Father, I, I thank you right now that we all come with open and receptive hearts. We say, to, we say speak to every one of us. Let no one leave the same. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. Hey, if you will, take the next 10 seconds, meet somebody around you as you take your seat. Welcome to One Church. We're so excited to have you here with us today. And uh, we always say this, that we know that we're not the church for everyone, but we're the church for someone. And we believe and we pray that that someone is you. And I am so excited because today is Launch Sunday for Sulphur Springs Campus. Come on, give it up for our Sulphur Springs Campus. We're so excited to have you with us. Uh, we, we believe that there is great things that God has in store for us. You're part of the family. We love you so much. We're hugging you from Royce City. Uh, we, are, we can't wait to hear how amazing this Sunday was. And it's going to just get better and better and better. And while I'm welcoming people, I just want to welcome everybody that watching, is watching online. We know this, that there are people that watch all over the world. And we, we want you to know that if you're ever in this area, please come in. I promise you, we'll make you feel at home. And uh, But we're so honored to have you. We've got a lot of great things happening here at One Church. Community groups are going on. Come on, you got to get plugged into a community group. They're happening uh, in an area near you, so get plugged into a community group. And uh, it's going to, uh, community groups will change your life. They really will change your life. And we kick it off in a brand new series called Welcome Home today. Welcome home. And uh, th this is our, this is what we call our declaration for the year. This is what we're doing this year. It's welcome home. We want everybody to know this, that you're welcome. No matter where you come from, you're welcome. No matter, no matter who you are, what your background is, you're welcome. And we want you to know that you're welcome. Come on, just, just, uh, just real quick, fist bump three people around you and tell them you're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Come on. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. That's, that's right. We want everybody to know this, that you're welcome. And because uh, and, and I, I feel like this, the church hasn't done a good job at that all the time. As making people, we want you to say, okay, you got to do this and this and this, and then you can become a part. But what Jesus always did was, you're welcome. Before you believe, but he, he invited the disciples, just follow before you believe in me, before you know what I'm going to do for you, before anything else, you just follow me, and, and I will make you a disciple. I will make you a fisher. I'll make you greater, and that's what the church is called to do. Just come on. You're welcome home. Amen? Amen. You got a Bible? Turn to Romans 8, 38 and 39. Romans 8, 38 and 39. Um, I'm really excited about this message. I think that it's going to help you. It's going to encourage you. Uh, Romans 8, 38 and 39, it says this, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. I think we could close it right there. Just finished, we're done, we're good to go. I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, 
neither our fears for today, listen to this, nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Absolutely nothing can separate you from God's love. If you're taking notes today, I'm kicking off this series with the message simply titled, Welcome Home. Amen? Lord, right now, we thank you for your presence in this place. Lord, we thank you that your word is sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, I thank you that every ear in here is open and receptive to hear your word. Lord, let every life leave change. Let no one be the same in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Come on, everybody said, amen. Amen. You know, uh, how many of you have ever had your parents embarrass you? Come on, can I see your hands? Your parents have actually humiliated you. They've embarrassed you. They, they've, I, I, I grew up, my parents were pretty cool, um, but every now and then they would embarrass me, right? Every now and then they would do something that would humiliate me. And one of the things that always humiliated me and embarrassed me is when my parents would brag on me about silly things. Right? I mean, you're sitting there going, why I'm, am, am I that hard to find something really great about that you're bragging about that thing, right? They, they brag on silly. My dad, his favorite thing to brag on, anytime he would talk about me or uh, around people, he would say, you know, he would talk about when I was born. Because when I was born, I was 10 pounds, 3 ounces. I was 23 and a half inch. Like, I was a big, I don't know what happened. I feel like I got gypped. I should have been like six, six foot five or something like, I should have been a lot bigger, but now then, here I am, I'm like, okay, I, I I'm, I'm, am what I am, and that's just who I am. And so, but I, uh, he always loved to tell, he, I was, right after I was delivered, they put me in the baby cart, and they're wheeling me down the hallway, and my dad's showing everybody, and he says this, and then my son lifts his head up and looks around. Apparently... Babies don't do that. I don't know why, but apparently babies don't have the muscle strength to do this. And so my dad, every time he was telling the story about me being born, that story came up. He was like, yep, he lifted his head up. And it, I, I mean, all the people were, I mean, all of Wichita Falls, Texas was in awe of my son and his neck muscles. I'm like, all right, at least I got neck muscles, right? At least it's something. But, you know, I always swore this. That my dad would launch into a story like that, or my mom would launch into a story about something else, and I'd be embarrassed, and I'd always say this, I'm going to be the cool parent. Oh, I would never do that to my kids. I will never embarrass my kids. Now that I'm thinking of ways to embarrass my kids, I don't know, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm like, how can I embarrass? I want the Uncle Buck car that shoots out and backfires black smoke. Like, that's kind of, you know, it's just another way to embarrass my kids. But I always said, I'm, I will never embarrass my kids. I will never humiliate. I will never tell stories about them lifting their head up off the, like, I'm not going to do that. But something happens. The moment you see your child, there's this switch that all of a sudden flips. You, I don't know what it is. I guess they're like little you. And, and they're, you, you see like a little bit of your wife and a, and, and a little bit of you, and it's like this perfect combination. And all, I mean, you are infatuated from the moment you see them. You fall in love with them from the moment. All of a sudden, love takes on a completely different meaning as soon as you lay eyes on them. And you're so proud, and you're texting everybody, and you're calling people, and you're talking about your new, like this new baby that just changed your entire life, and everybody is really polite, but the truth is, is they don't really care. I'm just going to tell you this right now on Instagram. People don't care about your kids. You care about your kids, but people don't care about your kids, right? And we're so proud we can't help it. We love them so much. We care about them so much that we want to tell the world. And before you know it, you've got somebody over and their baby book is out. And you're showing the, the picture of their first poo-poo in the potty. 
and you're and the the kids are going, why are you doing your the first bath? Here's their first bath, right? You got to show them all these pictures, and and then you go out in public, and it gets worse because they're playing sports, and you're in the stands screaming at the umpire because he called it a strike when it was clearly a ball because if it, it, you, and, and you're fighting for your kids because you love them. You're proud of them. You're overwhelmed with this sense of, I, I'm just crazy about you. I'm crazy passionate about you. I love you so much. And some of you are so over the top crazy that you can't just leave it in pictures in, come on, in picture albums at the house, you can't just leave it on the field. You've got to take it to the car. Come on, you, you take it to the car. And so I got some, I got some bumper stickers for, for you here. Uh, these are the, this is a typical bumper sticker you would see, right? My, my child is an honor student at Haywood, whatever, elementary. Lord Jesus, he better be, he, how's he going to spell that? He's got to be an honor student just to go to that school. Come on. How about this? Proud parent of a sailor. Come on. Give it up for our military. We love our military. Proud. This is a normal, right? This is what we would like. This is, this is great. How about this one? Proud parent of a D, D student. Come on. Now we're reaching. Hey, I'm proud of my kids. I love my kids. They're not straight A, but man, they're passing. At least they're passing. D student, we're proud of them. Come on. I, I think we got this one. My kid skateboards better than your honor student. Just going to throw it down. My kid's dumb, but he can skateboard, and I'm riding on that to be a career. That's what we're hoping for because nothing else is working for them. Uh, how about this? My son was inmate of the month. At Jackson County Jail. We're reaching at this point, people. Come on. My, my, my son was inmate of the month. We're that proud of our kids that we're going this far. How about this last one here? It says, proud parent, period. Proud parent, period. We just can't help it. We just love our kids. No matter what they do right, no matter what they do wrong, we just love our kids. If they're honor students, if they're sailors, we love them. If they're inmates of the month, we just love them. We just, we just love our kids and are crazy about them, and it's wired in our DNA. And what's incredible is the Bible tells us this, that according to, or compared to God, we're evil. Compared to God, the, Jesus says this, you, you being evil know how to give your kids good gifts. How much more does your heavenly father give good gifts to the, he, he's saying this, that you, in all your passion, in all your craziness, in all your love, in all your pride, in all, the, all of that going on, you, God looks at you and says, you don't even come close to how much I'm convinced that nothing can separate you from the love of God. I'm convinced that nothing, there's no no power on this earth and there's no power in the heavens above that can separate us from the love. And what Jesus was talking about the whole time he was on this earth, the entire time that he was on this earth. He was trying to let people know God loves you. See, there's something that happens in us, we get this, we have this mentality today, and there was a mentality even back then that God's angry. That God's mad at you, that his judgment is coming for you, that he's out to get you, he's looking for you to mess up, he's looking for you to make a mistake, he's looking for you to fall short in some way, shape, or form, and as soon as you do that, you're excommunicated, you're out of the family, you're no longer a part, he doesn't want to have anything to do with you, you, you are way over there, and we're over here, and I'm sorry you messed up. There's people that will even say this, that it, if you mess up one time, God is looking to kick you out. And Jesus comes in and he says, no, you got it all wrong. You have it all wrong. And so the entire time that he's preaching and he's talking, he's talking about the love of a father. He's talking about the love of God and how much he cares about you and how crazy he is about you and how much he accepts you and how much he, how much he believes in you. And once again, we see Jesus and he's trying to get this point across to the people. 
So he launches into a parable, which is just a story. It's made up. Jesus says, let me get this point across to you and try to get it into uh, to your head a way that you can understand it. So he talks about, in Luke 15, he talks about a son. And he, and he, he launches into this big, long story. And, and I, I know that probably a lot of you have probably heard about the prodigal son. So just for a moment, though, I want you just to flush what you know. I want you just to take this. See, sometimes we go through the Bible and we just read through it. I know this. I, 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 this is a redo. This is uh, this is leftovers. This is something. This isn't new. Like I'm just going to put it on the back. No, you just listen and tune in and take it from a new perspective. Act like you're the crowd that Jesus is talking to, and you're hearing this story unfold for you uh, for the very first time. Just, just take it like that. So he begins to launch into this story, and the son comes in, uh, and, and he's a brat. He, he comes up to his dad, and he says, Dad, listen, I've been thinking. I want you to take everything that, you, that belongs to me. I want you to take a third of everything that you have. I want you to liquidate it. How much work goes into that? I want you to liquidate what's mine, and I want you to give me the money. I want, I want all the money because I'm tired of being around here. I'm tired of the farm life. Come on, I didn't choose the farm life. The farm life chose me, right? I, I'm ty- I, I don't want to be here. I don't want to have anything to do with this. I've got a lot of great things that are, are in store for me, and it's not happening for me here. So I want you to liquidate everything. I, and I want you to give it to me. And what is basically what he's saying is, is Dad, I'm tired of waiting on you to die. Because that's the way inheritance works. Right? After your parents pass away or your grandparents pass away, then inheritance comes to you, not beforehand. And so the son has the gall to go up to him and say, I'm tired of waiting on you to die. Give me what belongs to me. And to my amazement, the dad goes, okay, you want it? You got it. I'll I'll, I'll work on it. I'll get it all settled. We're going to take care of this, and then I'll get it. And he gives him the money. And as soon as he gets the money, it says the son takes off. He moves to the city. Come on, he's, he begins to live his dream. Whatever he had dreamed about, whatever uh, prodigal literally means excessive spending. He spent whatever you can think about a teenage boy wanting, he spent money on that. He partied like a rock star. He had a great time. He was having so much fun. Everything was going good in life. But something happened out of the blue, out of the unexpected, and the unexpected hit, and a famine hits the land. Now, you can't plan for a famine. This famine hits the land, and he's left going, uh, he's living on, uh, and he was spending a ton, and now he finds himself that and now the investments aren't working like they're supposed to, and uh, the money's not coming in like it used to, and the interest, interest rates aren't what they used to be, and so now then I'm struggling to make ends meet, and he finds himself going broke. He's broke, and he's alone. He's by himself. And then he finds out that nobody that was with him when he had plenty of money, nobody that was partying with him, nobody that was having a good time with him, as long as he had the cash, nobody was hanging around him. He couldn't find anybody to help him out. He was completely broke and alone, and the only job that he could find was feeding pigs. This is insult to injury. Because to a Jewish person, pigs are disgusting. You don't touch pigs. You're not around pigs. You don't have anything to do with pigs. And the only job that he can find is at the very bottom of, like he has hit rock bottom. The Bible says this, that he comes to himself. He comes to himself and he realizes something. He goes, wait a second, my my." Parent, my dad's house has it better. Even the servants in my dad's house have plenty of food. They're not wanting for anything. And so he comes to himself and he makes a decision right then and there. I'm done feeding pigs. I'm done with this life. I'm going to go back to my dad's house. Yeah. That's where we pick up the story in Luke 15, verse 17. It says, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. 
I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, come on, you know you better have a speech. You people coming in late, come on, you know on Friday night, you sneaking in, you got a speech prepared. There's something happened. Dad, it was crazy. There was, uh, uh, the, 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 there was a parade. It was, it was a, a parade at 11, yeah, I don't know. It was a midnight parade, I guess. I don't know what was going on. So he's coming up with this speech, and he says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him coming. Now, you are already ahead of me, and you know the rest of the story. You probably know what happens next. But I want you just to take a step back and and think about this. What would I have done? Because these people are listening to this story for the first time, and they're thinking what you're thinking. They're thinking, you know what? This is this is a big deal. This this son did something crazy. This son did a lot of really messed up stuff. So what would you have done? Now I'm sitting back and I'm thinking, you know, uh, I see my son coming, and I'm and I'm proud that he's home. I was worried about him, but here's the thing: is there's going to need to be some explanation. Come on. I'm a Texas boy, so there's going to be a butt chewing. There's going to be something coming down the line. You ain't just walking off like, I see you coming. Oh, I see you coming. I, I see you coming down the road. I'm coming, and I, I'm coming after you. Right? I, 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 there's something going to happen. And I begin to put myself in this father's shoes and begin to think, you know, obviously, as a parent, you're happy to see your kids, but you know you got some stuff to talk about. You have some stuff that we need to go over. Like, I've got some things that we need to talk about and we need to to address before we move forward. Like, before you walk through my door, before you walk through the gates of my, uh, this farmhouse that you said wasn't good enough for you, and you said the grass is greener on the other side, pops, I'm out of here, and before you said, I can't wait for you to die, give me what you owe me, come on, I, I'm telling you right now, we've got some stuff to hash out. You think you're a grown man, let's go. Right, we're going to talk. So I thought, the way that I would have dressed, addressed it, the way I would have handled the situation is, sure, son, I'm glad you're home. But I would have asked some questions. Right. The first question that I would have asked the son is, why did you leave? Why, why did you leave? Why, why did you think that it was going to be better over there? Why did you think it was going to be more awesome over there? Why in the world did you leave? I took care of everything that you needed. You had everything you wanted right here. You had everything that you could possibly need and, and want, and I took care of you. And, and, and you lived under my roof, and never one day did you go and want. Never one day did you lack anything. Why did you leave? Why? Why would you take off? Why would you leave me? Why, why, would, you, why would you do this? What, and, and here's the deal is that I, as a parent, sometimes when your kids do stupid, you ask, why? Why? My son decided that one day he was going to take crayons off the coloring book and color the walls. And I walk in, and he's coloring on the walls, and I look at him, and I said, Why? You have a coloring book right there. Like, why are you coloring? You know that this is not what you're supposed to do. And here's the thing, is there's no excuse for stupid. There, and, and as a, a parent, most of us know the, the most common answer for when our kids do something they know they shouldn't have done, they make a mistake, and we go up and we say, why did you do this? We get the, come on, the classic shoulder shrug. I, And then if you finally get a response because you keep pressing, you keep pushing, come on. I said, why did you do that? And finally you might get a, I don't know. I don't know. Because we can't explain it. 
I was stuck on stupid, Dad. I'm sorry. I don't know what I was thinking. I just did it. I know I shouldn't have done it, and, and it was a momentary lapse of judgment. But here's the deal is that the Father doesn't ask why because he knows that it cannot be excused. But I still have a hard time thinking, I want to know why you hurt me. I want to know why you turned your back on me. I want to know why after all of these years of me taking care of you, giving you everything I have, why did you leave? Why? The father knew that there's no good answer to why. Why doesn't justify it? Why doesn't fix it? A lot of people get stuck on why. Why? Well, why did this happen? Why did this go on? Why, why? And we get stuck on why. And here's the thing is that there are times in life that why will never be answered. And you can die in why. You can freeze your life, you can pause your life, and you can stop. And why? But I would still want to know why he left. The second thing I think that the father, if I was the father in this situation, my son had just taken a third of everything that I had and he took off and he lived his life like a crazy man. I would want to know this, where'd you go? Oh, where you been, boy? Huh? I, I want to know, like, where did you go? Because as parents, we want to know where our kids are. We want to know where they've been. Like, I want to know every move you make. Come on, I, I want to know where you're at. We got this app called Life360. <laughs> Parents, I highly suggest this app because your kids log into this. You log your kids, and you can tell where they're at at every moment of the day. I can tell when you're going to the bathroom. I can tell when you're over at a friend's house. I can tell when you're walking down the road. I can tell when you're riding a golf cart down the road. Like, I know, and I get these little alerts. It says, Braley left home. I'm like, okay, girl, where'd you go? So I'm texting, where'd you go? I, 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 I just went on a golf cart ride. Okay, okay, that's cool. You know, but we want to know where our kids are. Where did you go? My uh, son... We were at church one day, we had a guest speaker, and I'm sitting second service, and we're hanging out, and, and my wife is, is working uh, uh, very hard uh, at doing check-in and stuff in the back, and so she wasn't in service, and, and I'm sitting in service, hanging out, and all of a sudden, towards the end of the service, I get this text message, and said, hey, have Bear bring me my computer charger. First thing I did was look for the computer charger, and I found it, I located it, and then I start looking for Bear. My son, in whom I am well pleased. Where are you? And I can't see him anywhere. And so the service ends, and I said, hey, have, have you seen Bear? No Bear. I'm starting to freak out a little bit because apparently I was on Bear duty, and I didn't even know it. I had no idea that I was on bear duty, and I'm sitting here going, okay, where is my son at? And so I'm asking the kids' pastors. I'm asking, like, I'm asking greeters. I'm asking ushers. I'm asking the guest speaker. I'm like, like, do you know where my son is? Like, I can't find my son anywhere. I go back to my wife, and I said, I can't find bear anywhere. She goes, oh, he'll be fine. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. I don't know where my son's at, like, and I am genuinely worried at this point. Like, somebody took my son. About 15 minutes goes by. Can't find my son anywhere, and we get a call from his grandmother. And she said, oh, I forgot to tell you that I took Bear with me to Whataburger because he was hungry. I'm like, don't feed the bear. Come on. You, you, you don't do, like, don't, you got to let me know this stuff. And of course, she was apologetic. She said, I'm so sorry. I should have just texted you and let you know that I was taking him home after. But the as moment I saw him, I said, where were you? You had me so worried. Where were you? I, as a father, I would go want to know this answer to this question. Where did you go? Where did you go? Where, where, where did you go? Where did, why did you leave my side and where did you go? Because as a parent, I want to know where you've been. I want to know where, where you went. 
the last thing I would ask as a father, and this is a big one, what did you do? This question right here kept me out of a lot of trouble because I knew that on Friday and Saturday nights, when I'd been out with my friends, I'd been having a good time, like we're, we're just out doing, I was a good kid. I was actually a good pastor's kid, but, but I, 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 I behaved myself, but I knew one reason, one thing that kept me behaving myself is I knew when I walked through those doors on time, because I better not be late, I knew that when I walked through those doors, a question would come out of my dad's mouth. He would ask me, what did you do? And depending on my answer, really could determine the night. Here's the thing is some of y'all are like, well, just lie. I am a horrible liar. I'm not good at lying. I feel bad. I feel guilt. I will tell on myself in a minute. I know I'm in trouble, but I cannot lie. I just can't do it. I can't bring myself to do it. And so I'd always tell my dad, and depending on the answer, really determined or changed my Friday night or Saturday night. If, if everything was good, this is what we did. We just went to the movies, and then we came home. Okay, you're good to go. But if we did some things that we probably shouldn't have done, what my answer in that situation would determine is if I'm grounded or dead. <laughs> right? I, I, am I going to ground you or am I going to kill you? Like, there, there's, a, there's a big variation here. And here's the deal, is that I never came close to doing what this son did. I never said, hey, pops, give me a third of everything you got. I got to go party. I got to go take care of some business. Come on. The ladies are calling. Like, I didn't do any of that. And, and the, the, the dad doesn't even ask, what did you do? He doesn't even take a moment and say, what, what did you do while you were gone? What did you do while you were out there? He doesn't ask that question. He doesn't even think about responding that way. He doesn't even think about talking to him that way. Jesus takes it on and he says, he, he begins to, to show how different we are from God. And I guarantee you that everybody in the crowd was thinking the same exact thing. They were thinking, I would be asking these questions. Why, where, and what? And they hear this going down, and they see the father running, and he's the, they're thinking, he's going to throw the smack down. He is about to throw the smack down. He, oh, this son is about to get it. And Jesus flips the script. And we read on in verse 20. It says, Luke 15 and verse 20, it says, And he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him, and he had compassion. And he ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. What a beautiful story. See, and I guarantee you, everybody in that crowd was going, What? Oh no, no! You're you're still my son, and, and, and I'm still I'm still I'm happy to see you. But here's the thing: is the father had compassion and ran before he could hear the excuses, before he ever knew about the famine, before he ever knew about the loneliness, before he ever knew about the pigs. He just saw his son walking down the road towards him, and he knew that something must have gone wrong. Something must have happened there must have been some really hard things that hit him and he didn't expect it and the father had been in the world he had seen the world and he knew what was out there and he said this I see my son coming and I know that he's walking with a limp and he's walking with a little difficulty but he's coming home and I have compassion on my son so he ran to him I ran to him and it, no excuse needed no, I, I don't need to hear about it. What kind of father embraces the son before he hears the excuse? What kind of father does that? What kind of love is this? Because I love my son, but I'm going to need to hear some excuses. I need to hear what's going on. And Jesus says this. No, you don't understand. I'm going to take it a step further. And he goes on and he says in, in verse uh, 21 through 22, says, and the son said to him, come on, the speech is coming out. Dad, you see what had happened was, 
Come on, the speech is coming out. He said, and the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe. Put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. See, what he did is the father restored him. The father had compassion on him, and then immediately the father restored him. Here's the deal, is that you're my son as soon as I see you coming down the road. But as soon as I see you coming down the road, after you took a third of everything I got, and you went out and you spent it on some crazy living, and you did some really stupid things, guess what? You're going to have to earn your position back. Like, I'm not just going to give you everything that you had. Come on, you got to earn your privileges back. Where are you parents at? You know, you're grounded, buddy. You ain't getting nothing. You can't wipe your nose without talking to me first, right? You, you can't do anything. And, and I'm going to be, I'm, I'm like, I still love you. But I, I want to kill you right now, but I still love you. But not this father. He immediately restores his position. He immediately says this, because when he put the ring on his finger, he said, you're my son. All, all the rights and everything that I have belong to you. As soon as I put the robe on and sandals on your feet, you're not a servant. You are my son. See, here's the deal is that we call this son the prodigal son. But the father never called him the prodigal son. The father only called him son. Because who the son was wasn't wrapped up in his behavior. Wow. Who the son was was wrapped up in the relationship. Wow. And I'm here to tell you that what you did is not you. The mistakes that you made, they're not you. The failures that you've had happen in your life, they're not you. And God is not looking at you and saying, you are this mistake. You are this fault. You are this failure. You are this addiction. He's not looking at you with condemnation. He's saying this, you are my son. You are my daughter. See, we get caught up in what you did. But God gets caught up in who I created you to be. This is who I created you to be. The last thing that I love is this. The father has compassion. The father uh, restores the son. The last thing is this, the father celebrates his return. He celebrates his return. He, he, he doesn't even think about it. He, do, he doesn't, it doesn't even cross his mind. He begins to say, you know what, we're going to celebrate. I love this in, in, in this passage right here. It goes, and, and, and it, he says to, he's talking to everybody around him that came out, and he says this, go kill the calf we have been fattening. Here's the deal is, is the father had already been planning a return. He's already ready. He goes, you go kill the calf that we've been fattening. We must celebrate with steaks tonight. Come on, somebody. We got we to have some steaks. And he says this, for the son of mine was dead and is now returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. So the party began. See, God was, Jesus was saying this, God wants to party with you. When you come back to the Father, God is looking to throw a party. What kind of love is this? What kind of incredible love does God the Father have for his people when he says this? You know what? In a moment, without excuses, without knowing where, what, and when you went and did whatever you did, without knowing any of that, I can take you from a ditch to a dance floor in a matter of moments. I can take you from where you were to where I'm going to take you in just a matter. I can just imagine the son's out there like dad but I got a speech you know I got this whole speech going on like I, I and the son, dad, the dad just goes keep dancing son you're back in my house you're where you belong you're exactly in the right place you just keep dancing son I'm taking you from a ditch to a dance floor the father celebrates him he just celebrates him and here's the deal is that some of you Maybe thinking you might have, you might feel like the prodigal son. You might feel like the prodigal daughter. Because you walked away from the relationship. You walked away from what you know was right. You walked away from what you know you should have done. 
And because you walked away, you feel like this, that if I come back, I would love to come back into relationship with God. I would love to come back into that kind of relationship, but I'm afraid. But if I do, he's going to know why. He's going to want to know why. He's going to know He's going to want to know why I left. He's going to want to know where I went. I'm pretty sure he's going to know, want to know what I did. And I'm too embarrassed. And I'm too ashamed. And I just can't do it. I can't bring myself to do that. And I love this because we think, we think this way because justice says we must answer why. We must answer where, and we must answer what, because that's what will justify us, and that's what will bring us back into relationship. But here's what's incredible about God's love. Grace simply answers this. Welcome home. Whatever you've done, welcome home. Where have you been? Welcome home. I don't care where you did where you did or who you did it with. I don't care what you've been doing. I don't care anything. I, I, I just want you to know you're welcome back into my house. You're, you're a son. You're a daughter. You're not the mistakes. You're not the fault. You're not the failure. Welcome home. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, you're not looking around. And this is you. And today, I'm here to declare to you what Jesus declared over 2,000 years ago. The door is open. The door is open. God loves you so much, friend. He cares so much for you. He, 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 he's not thinking about all the mistakes that you made. He's thinking about the relationship that he wants with you. Maybe you're in this place and you say, I've walked away from my relationship with God, but if I can come home. See, it's a moment of realization that I came to myself. If I can just come home, today you can come home. Maybe you're here in this place and you say, Brian, I've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of my life. I've never asked him into my heart. I've never asked him to forgive me of my sins, but today I want to. I'm not gonna embarrass you. I'm not gonna call you forward, but if you're in this place and you say, Brian, that's me. I need Jesus in my life for the first time. Or today, I want to restore my relationship. I want to rededicate my life to Jesus. If you say, that's me, Brian, I need, you. I, I need to accept Jesus for the first time. Or I'm rededicating my life to him. On the count of three, I'm going to ask you to be bold enough just to slip your hand up and you can put it right down. And then we're going to pray a prayer together. And I believe this, if you pray this prayer, if you believe it in your heart, your life will never, ever be the same. Why do I say that? Because my life has never been the same. Brian, that's me. I need Jesus in my life, one. I need to rededicate my life to Jesus, two. I'm ready to come home, three. Just lift your hand in this place, amen, amen, amen. I see those hands, amen, 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 amen. Let's pray this prayer together as a church family. Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Take my sin, and by your grace, I take your righteousness. I make you the Lord of my life. I give you all that I am. I hold nothing back. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. Come on, give it up for every person that prayed that prayer today. We are so excited. Hey, if you prayed that prayer, do us a favor and text DECIDED to 33733. That's DECIDED to 33733. We're not going to stalk you, but we want to make sure that you have everything you need as you begin this incredible journey of faith. Amen. We love you. At One Church, we aim to help you encounter Jesus. If God is using this ministry to impact your life, join us by investing in others today. You can go to IamOneChurch.com/give. Thanks for watching, and we hope you have a great week.